Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Wednesday, February 2nd, and tonight we're talking about the NFL. A former head coach is suing the league for systemic racial discrimination. He says it's part of a long-standing pattern that needs to end. The NFL claims that the case has no merit. We'll get into the case with two weeks before the Super Bowl. Washington's football team is not in the big game, but it does have a new name. The old mascot was a racial slur that stood for nearly 90 years. See what you think of the replacement. Plus, Mexico remains uniquely dangerous for journalists. Four have been killed just this year. Why is this happening? And what would help keep reporters safe? Also, an effort is gaining steam to kick two Republicans out of the party, largely for their stances against former President Trump. But not everyone in the GOP wants this public fight with the midterms on the way. And the Olympics are officially underway. We'll take you to Beijing for a look at the Winter Games. It's been kind of a busy week in the NFL. For starters, the Super Bowl is set now. The LA Rams and the Cincinnati Bengals will play for the Lombardi Trophy. Whoever you're rooting for, the Super Bowl is next Sunday night on NBC, which, like this network, is owned by NBC Universal. Also, renowned quarterback Tom Brady announced his retirement after 22 seasons in the league. Mr. Brady missed another Super Bowl show with the Buccaneers after losing to the Rams last weekend. And the Washington football team has an actual mascot now, the Commanders. More on that in just a moment. But we begin tonight with the former head coach of the Miami Dolphins. Yesterday, Brian Flores sued the NFL, accusing the league of systemic discrimination. He named three teams in the suit, the Dolphins, the New York Giants, and the Denver Broncos. All three teams are denying the allegations, and the NFL said the claims are without merit. But the accusations run even deeper than racial bias. Mr. Flores claims that he was offered cash incentives to lose games, allegedly by the Dolphins' owner. According to the lawsuit, back in 2019, owner Stephen Ross tried to bribe Mr. Flores with $100,000 for each game the team lost. Supposedly, the idea was to get the Finns better placement in the NFL draft because lower-ranked teams pick hot pick first. Brian Flores says he refused, driving a wedge between him and management. The lawsuit also included a text message exchange between him and his former boss, New England Patriots head coach Bill Belichick. Apparently, Mr. Belichick accidentally texted his congratulations for getting the head coaching job with the Giants, which Flores did not actually get. Now, according to the suit, Mr. Belichick wrote, sounds like you've landed. Congrats. Flores responded, did you hear something I didn't hear? Flores eventually asks if Belichick realized he was not texting with Brian Dable, who got the job. At that, Belichick apparently realized he screwed up and broke the news to Flores. Today, Brian Flores told NBC's Gay Gutierrez that those texts were a tipping point. Uh, I was humiliated. You know, here I am for you know, 10, 15 minutes sitting there going, and, uh, you know, I realized I dream, so I dream job. I grew up in New York. I grew up you know, eight miles from here, probably less than that. Um, uh, and um, there was anger, there was uh, disappointment, disbelief, and um, that was really the tipping point. That's when, um, you know, do I... It, it, I should, be, I should be given an opportunity. I've earned that. I have. Let's get into this with Michael McCann, a legal analyst and senior sports legal reporter at Sportico, and Randall Hill. He played in the NFL for much of the 90s, including for the Dolphins. Gentlemen, good to have you both with us. And Mr. Hill, I wonder, first of all, what your reaction is to the lawsuit, particularly in light of your experience in the NFL and with the Dolphins. Well, a lawsuit is a lawsuit, and anyone can, um, you know, uh, uh, claim a lawsuit. Um, but it doesn't mean that the facts are, are necessarily uh, valid. So that's when, it, you know, it's, it's time to do an investigation um, and, and look at uh, all the legal avenues and, and find out if uh, the, the allegations are actually true. 
Um, but, you know, when it comes to, to, to this particular incident, I, I know that there's been talk about racism uh, in the NFL. Uh, the NFL has been good to me, and I'm, I'm usually looking at the positive aspects of, of business entities such as the NFL. So um, I think the NFL should have their, their day in court and be able to, to, to speak what they feel is uh, factually true. Did you encounter anything in the NFL, Mr. Hill, like what Mr. Flores is describing in terms of, you know, cultural and systemic forms of racial discrimination? No, I didn't personally uh, uh, experience anything like that in the NFL, and I don't know, and I can't really speak for any of my former teammates. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, you know, is, is, is any entity or business entity perfect? No. Um, and there's always room for, for change, and there's always uh, ways to, to better uh, any type of business entity. But, um, you know, the NFL is, is probably going to take a long look at this, and, uh, and they're going to find out if there, uh, is type, is, if there is that type of racism um, that is uh, systemic uh, within the NFL. Mr. McCann, I'd love to get your thoughts on this lawsuit, particularly in light of one paragraph that's early, like high, high up in the lawsuit document. This paragraph really stood out to me. Quote, in certain critical ways, the NFL is racially segregated and is managed much like a plantation. Its 32 owners, none of whom are black, profit substantially from the labor of NFL players, 70% of whom are black. The owners watch the games from atop NFL stadiums in their luxury boxes, while their majority black workforce put their bodies on the line every Sunday, taking vicious hits and suffering debilitating injuries to their bodies and their brains, while the NFL and its owners reap billions of dollars, unquote. Mr. McCann, sounds like he's trying to get relief not just for what happened to him, but to blow the door open on a lot of things that he alleges are going on in the league right now. Yeah, this is a lawsuit that's more than just about him, clearly. He is arguing that there, there is a legacy of discrimination that goes well beyond Brian Flores that involves hiring practices, that involves how coaches are fired, how quickly they're fired and their race, and also interviews, how the interview process works. So this is a, a sweeping lawsuit that goes uh, far and wide, similar to, to Kurt Flood years ago challenge baseball over the reserve clause, or more recently, Ed O'Bannon taking on the NCAA. And in both cases, there were issues of race. And Flores clearly believes that there, these practices that include the Rooney rule, where teams are obligated to conduct interviews, that interviews are now being conducted in a way that's maybe technically in line with that policy, but not in the spirit of it. Yeah, explain what that is, by the way. He alleges that the Rooney rule was used as a pretext to bring him in for some head coaching jobs, including one with the Denver Broncos, just as basically a way to sort of check a box and say, yeah, yeah, we interviewed a black guy, now let's go ahead and hire the person we had intended to hire. That was the upshot of the text message, as he alleges it, between himself and Bill Belichick. But for people who don't know, what is the Rooney rule and how is it relevant here? Sure, so the Rooney rule is the rule that teams must hire, excuse me, must interview minority candidates before they can fill certain positions, including head coach and other positions, but head coach is the big one. And he has argued that teams are, as you said, Joshua, checking the box, that they're not doing real interviews, that they're going through the motions. Now, interestingly, the teams could say that even if that's true, that's not illegal, that it's not an act of racism, that they're complying with the league rule, that their intent is not to be racist, but rather they have a fiduciary duty to the league that they need to meet. That's not necessarily the greatest explanation in terms of public relations, nor is it the greatest explanation in terms of being equitable and thinking about diversity, but it is legally potentially a defense. And also in the context of when he interviewed, with, you mentioned earlier, the Belichick text, well, the Giants could say, we hadn't yet hired anyone else. Coaches have a history of backing out at the last second. Uh, Josh McDaniels was uh, going to be the coach of the Colts several years ago, but he backed out at the last second, and that they were doing their due diligence. So there are defenses to some of these claims. Mr. Hill, Gabe Gutierrez asked Brian Flores if he thought that the NFL was racist. Listen to how Mr. Flores responded to that. You don't need a lawsuit to see... Um, that there's a problem in the, let's call it, the head coaching and executive... Uh, level positions in the, in the National Football League. I think the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, the lawsuit will, will just, you know, we just felt like uh, we'll shed more light on that and um, 
create a situation where um, we'll, we'll force change, because um, we, we need that. You know, one of the things he talks about in the lawsuit is wanting more transparency in terms of hiring practices in the NFL and so forth. And I think transparency is something that at least a lot of black NFL fans have been demanding ever since what happened with Colin Kaepernick and the San Francisco 49ers. What do you think would help to address some of the concerns about race in the NFL? Well, I, I think that one of the things that you could do is definitely communicate well. Um, try to have some more of the minorities actually in on the development of the NFL, uh, and, and when the NFL cha- when the NFL changes, uh, have some of the uh, minority players and or assistant coaches, um, you know, sit in on some of those uh, meetings to try to help develop the NFL in a better way. Um, but but specifically going back to talking about uh, the situation that uh, Ms. Flores is in, I think he would, he would have gained a little bit more credibility if he would have uh, filed that lawsuit when he got ma- when he when he got hired. Um, you know, because if there is racism in in the NFL, then it didn't start when he got fired. It was probably there before he even got hired. So you know, why would it take uh, for him to get fired for him to actually speak up? Speak up when, when even though the sun may be shining on you and still frowning on, on others. So, um, you know, I'm, I want to see how this whole thing plays out, and I want to see how the NFL uh, responds. I want to make sure I understand what you're, what you're getting at. You're saying that he should have sued for discrimination when a team hired him? Wouldn't that have weakened yeah, his I'm claim? Saying- no, I, I think it was a strengthen claim because now, you know, people can say, well, oh, well, it's spoiled milk. It's sour, it's sour milk. Oh, he's upset because he got fired. Um, if there was racism, um, then the racism didn't start when he got fired. That's what I'm trying to say. Before I have to let y'all go, uh, Mr. McCann, with regards to where this goes from here, I wonder how you see the NFL responding to this. This whole issue of race and hiring is coming up in a number of different places including President Biden's next pick for the U.S. Supreme Court. He said that it was going to be an African-American woman, campaigned on that, has stuck with that, and is getting flack from some Republicans for that. How do you see the NFL dealing with this issue? Is it just the Rooney rule going forward, or is there any effort to try to address some of these concerns from within the league? Well, they clearly have to do something to address these concerns, because the Rooney rule isn't working, at least as it was intended. Now, I think part of the issue, and, and Randall, I think you, you noted this, that the owners are really the deciders here, right? The owners decide who they want as a coach, that it isn't the league per se. Roger Goodell, the commissioner, can't force a team to hire a particular coach. So there are opportunities where maybe coaches could could get more information or more yeah. training on issues of diversity. I mean, it, it could be that is part of the issue beyond the claims yeah. in the case, that that the decision maker needs to be more aware and more more appreciative mm-hmm. of the concerns that have been raised. Michael McCann, legal analyst and senior sports legal reporter at Sportico and former NFL player Randall Hill. Gentlemen, I appreciate you both making time for us. Thank you both very much. Very much. Thanks, Meanwhile, yeah, Washington's NFL franchise officially has a new name. Finally, this football team is no longer called football team. They are the commanders now. Some of your opinions on the new name were mixed. And forgive me in advance for mentioning the previous mascot in reading this comment. Mike wrote, Redskins was offensive to a lot of people. And if you go way back to George Preston Marshall, they were an offensive franchise. So good change. George Preston Marshall, by the way, was the team's longtime owner. But this is a new chapter for the franchise. NBC's Josh Letterman has more on how we got here. We are the Commanders. A new era is kicking off for Washington's NFL franchise, the team announcing its new name, the Washington Commanders. After a search that started with the decision more than a year and a half ago to get rid of the old name, dividing fans and raising painful questions about oppression in America's past and present. You know, it's a name that has the weight and meaning befitting a 90-year-old franchise. It's something that broadly resonated with our fans. And it's something that we believe embodies the values of service and leadership that really define the DMV in this community. So how did we get here? The team was founded in 1932 as the Boston Braves, the same name as a baseball team, which eventually moved to Atlanta. 
The team's owner, George Preston Marshall, felt that having two teams share the same name was confusing. So in 1933, he changed his to the Redskins. They moved right here to Washington, D.C. in 1937 and introduced this logo. There's been a lot of pushback over the years, protests going back to the 1970s, but um, it wasn't until like the last couple years um, when it really ramped up. The first push to change the name came in 1972 when Native American groups wrote to ownership saying it was offensive and promoted negative stereotypes. Later that year, the team debuted a new logo designed by a tribal leader that it used through 2019. In 1992, a group of Native Americans petitioned the U.S. Trademark and Patent Office to cancel the team's trademark of the word Redskins. The legal battle lasting nearly 30 years and winding its way to the Supreme Court, where the team won. Current owner Dan Snyder resisted public pressure for years. But after George Floyd's murder in May 2020, the nationwide reckoning over racial justice spread to the sports world. Pressure grew from Washington sponsors, including FedEx, which owns the naming rights to the team stadium. Even as recently as 2013, Dan Snyder said, I'm absolutely not changing the name. It wasn't until these sponsors like FedEx and Nike and Pepsi really spoke up and said, you've got to change the name or we're out. That's just something that the team couldn't afford to do. In July 2020, the team announced it was retiring the Redskins name and would be called the Washington football team while a search for a new name was underway. Less than a month later, they hired Jason Wright as the team's president, the first black man to hold that job in the NFL. The NFL is moving in the right direction. Society is moving in the right direction. But the thing is, is it's only a small step. Former Minnesota Vikings punter Chris Cluey was among the NFL players who advocated publicly for the name to change. What role do you think the pressure from sponsors played in getting them to change their mind? A huge role. There's only so much that public pressure can do. Um, at the end of the day, the NFL is a business. Um, and each team is its own individual business. And once you start affecting the bottom line, that's when change starts happening. Washington isn't the only franchise that's felt pressure from Native American groups who say their misuse of indigenous culture is offensive. You see, it has always been Cleveland. That's the best part of our name. And together, we are all Cleveland Guardians. Cleveland's baseball team changed its name last year from the Indians to the Guardians. But the Atlanta Braves, the Kansas City Chiefs, and the NHL's Chicago Blackhawks have no plans to change their names. Braves and Chiefs fans also do the celebratory tomahawk chop, despite decades of calls to stop. NBC News reached out to the Braves, the Chiefs, and the Blackhawks, but none of the teams commented. It's an important time in, in sports history, and I, I think this is one of those key moments where athletes are, are speaking up more about causes that are important to them, and, and teams themselves have had to really look in the mirror. And it's very easy to feel discriminated against when you walk down the street and someone is wearing a hat with a racial slur on And again, it's a shame that we did not fix that earlier. That was NBC's Josh Letterman reporting. Still to come tonight, Representatives Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger could be expelled from their own party. Former Republican Congressman David Jolly will join us to share his insights on this. And later, the opening ceremonies are on Friday, but Olympic athletes are already going for gold. We'll have an update from Beijing. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. The paperwork is piling up for the January 6th Select Committee, but that's the way they want it, and more documents are on the way. Today, the committee remotely interviewed Stuart Rhodes, the leader of the Oath Keepers, for six hours. Mr. Rhodes is in a federal jail awaiting trial on sedition charges. His lawyer estimated that Rhodes invoked his Fifth Amendment rights 20 to 30 times today. No comment so far from the committee on this interview. Meanwhile, documents from former Vice President Mike Pence are on their way to the committee. Yesterday, the National Archives told members that it will deliver the papers in about a month. Former President Trump could go back to court to try and stop that transfer. The January 6th committee already got hundreds of pages of archived Trump White House documents. Some of them had been ripped, apparently by the former president. Government officials taped them back together. Meanwhile, the Republican Party will consider punishing two GOP House members by putting them out of the party. Both of them have been outspoken against former President Trump. The proposal calls for the Republican National Committee to formally kick Representatives Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger out. That could happen this week at the RNC's winter meeting. 
Leading this push is RNC member and former Trump campaign advisor David Bossie. At least 50 RNC members are now supporting him. Representatives Cheney and Kinzinger both voted to impeach Mr. Trump last year. They are the only Republican members of the January 6th committee. And Representative Cheney has already been stripped of her leadership position. In a statement yesterday, she said, quote, I'm a constitutional conservative and I do not recognize those in my party who have abandoned the Constitution to embrace Donald Trump. History will be their judge. I will never stop fighting for our constitutional republic no matter what, unquote. As for Mr. Kinzinger, an official from his office told NBC News, quote, We'll see what happens. I think their time would be better served by focusing on 2022 rather than an unprecedented and short-sighted effort to purge two lifelong Republicans for simply telling the truth and upholding their oaths of office, unquote. Let's discuss all of this with former Republican Congressman David Jolly. He represented Florida in the U.S. House from 2014 to 2017, but left the GOP in 2018, and he is an MSNBC political analyst. Congressman Jolly, welcome to the program. Good to see you again. Good to be with you, Joshua. What do you make of all this? Yeah, um, look, it's easy in this era to suggest it's no surprise, but I think we do have to recognize the gravity of it, which is substantively one of the two major political parties is willing to eject its own members for trying to hold to account a former president who, had he been successful, for instance, in having DHS seize voter boxes, or had the insurrection been successful in, in either influencing or physically harming Mike Pence and ultimately delaying or, or not certifying the electors, that man that this party is defending is who Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney are trying to hold account, and that seems to be the mortal sin within this party. So, substantively speaking, it is a testament to where this party is, that they are willing to kick out people who are simply trying to follow what they believe to be their constitutional duty. Politically, I would mind re remind Republicans, Donald Trump won the Electoral College while losing the popular vote in 16. But GOP, you got destroyed in the 18 midterms. You got destroyed in the 2020 presidency. Your coalition, as it grows more Trumpian, is actually growing smaller in numbers. And so politically, this move, Joshua, makes absolutely no sense. Politics is a game of addition, not subtraction, and they're actually subtracting. They're, they're choosing to subtract from their coalition, which will put them in a harder place to grow a majority party going forward. I wonder, just the contrarian in me, kind of wonders about the future of Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney. Granted, Adam Kinzinger is not running for re-election. Liz Cheney is. But yeah. part of me wonders about their future in this party, particularly their decision to remain Republican. I have been in my share of bad relationships, and every relationship <laughs> of mine that went bad went bad because I stayed too long. I yeah. think that when I should have gotten the hint that this wasn't working, I should have taken off. Why would they <laughs> stay in a party that's made it really clear that it doesn't want them? Yeah, so part of it is, look, and I, and I made that journey, I, a lifelong Republican, starting in 2010, realizing maybe this isn't my party. And then, Joshua, in December 2015, when Trump called for the Muslim ban, I went to the floor of the House and called on Donald Trump to drop out of the race. The, the only sitting Republican to use the House well to condemn Donald Trump and call for his ouster then. And you can imagine what happened to me. I became a pariah within the party. The party stopped spending money on me. Few people would speak to me. So I know the journey that Kinzinger and Cheney are taking. They're taking it in a much more public profile than I did as a backbench member of Congress. And what they will discover in this journey is there is no ability to reclaim the party. Part of the, the journey is thinking you can reclaim the party, win the old party back. They can't. And so the decision they face is do they stay within this party that, frankly, is undermining the Constitution and the rule of law, or do they leave the party? And what does that look like? Because I will tell you, when you leave a major party, there's not really the push to join the other major party, right? Each party kind of crushes independent thought in one way or another. It just so happens that today's Republican Party is doing it in a way around the bounds of the Constitution. So I think eventually you'll see Cheney and Kinzinger as political independents. I wonder where you see that, though. Because, well, first of all, I appreciate you describing what you went through because this is not purely theoretical, right? Political parties are also fundraising machines. They're marketing machines. They provide research and support. And, like, you can lose a lot when you, when you go about setting a political career as an independent. That doesn't mean you can't win, but it, you, you give up certain things. 
But with regards to those voters that you say the GOP is missing out on, I'm not sure what the option there is either. I mean, currently, if you look at the latest Gallup polls, pluralities of voters describe themselves as either moderate or conservative. Liberal is a much smaller group. Democrat usually is larger than Republican, but independent is also gigantic. So I'm not sure what the political future is for, say, they go independent, for independent conservatives. Like, where do you end up? Yeah, so Joshua, I'm actually working in the space trying to coalesce roughly 40 percent of the country who, when they register to vote, reject either the Republican or Democratic Party. But there's this mistake we often make that somehow if you're an independent, you're necessarily a moderate or a centrist. That's not true. The independent political uh, constituency, if you will, is the most diverse in the country. And that's why it's always hard to kind of wrangle the independent movement into to a, a coalescing force, if you will. Look, I, I think what you will see is Kinzinger and Cheney without a home, and but among voters, and this is more important because the voters' voice here is clear. The voters in 2020, enough of those disenchanted former GOP performing voters said, we're voting with Joe Biden because we want to get rid of Trump and Trumpism. That's the most important political coalition in the country today, the one that stopped Donald Trump, and that is traditionally performing Democrats disaffected Republicans and a large swath of independents who said the most pressing question we face as a nation is whether Donald Trump continues in leadership or not. In 2020, enough, pe- enough Americans said no more Donald Trump. And that coalition, listen, Democrats, please, that is the most important coalition going into 24 is the one that stopped Trump in 2020. Don't let that break apart under your leadership. And just before we go, I wanted to also just clarify, put a finer point on the statistic that I just mentioned. This is from a Gallup poll that came out just a few weeks ago, January 17th, in terms of political ideology, not party, but ideology. And the latest Gallup poll, it shows that 37% of voters describe themselves as moderate, 36% describe themselves as conservative, 25% describe themselves as liberal. The liberal share has been going up for decades. The moderate conservatives have slowly been inching down, but Gallup polls have shown for decades that far more Americans describe themselves as moderate or conservative than liberal. So I hear where you're coming from in terms of this potential block that can be coalesced. Former Congressman David Jolly, always good to talk to you, sir. Thank you very much. You as well. Thank you, Joshua. We all know a business or a restaurant that did not survive the pandemic. We'll hear some personal stories of owners trying to keep their businesses alive just ahead. Stay close. You know, for a lot of us, navigating COVID has felt like one step forward and two steps back. That has certainly been true for the restaurant industry, too. Many of them have struggled to get back on track since the pandemic began two years ago. Nationwide, restaurant reservations are down 23% from two years ago. That's according to data from the app Open Table. Now, some restaurateurs are asking Congress to do more. NBC's Maura Barrett has that story. Five minutes or ten minutes? When Diana Davila opened Mitokaya, she had a vision for her restaurant. We prize so much that feels like the flavors of our home that really, in large part, that the woman uh, have have made. So really kind of showcasing those flavors in a very sort of mi casa, tu casa sort of a way. Three years into the business, though, she was met with the pandemic, trying to stay afloat ever since, now coming up on the fifth anniversary. We went from 25 employees to, at the end, it was four employees. I would love nothing more to have a place that's not just uh, a flavor of the Mons, but uh, hopefully be a, a, a staple Um, in in Chicago. How could that hope become a reality? More money allocated towards the restaurant relief fund, she says. We have done everything the right way when you want that sort of American dream. It would be such a shame to lose, I don't want to say my business, I feel like our business of Mitokaya to see her go away because our government couldn't 
put something together. Two years into the pandemic, restaurants still face a constant struggle due to the Omicron surge, the labor shortage, and cost increases, experts say. Just last week, we had a series of calls uh, with our community, um, and they're pretty much a breaking point. Right now, we need help from Congress. We need federal relief and state relief. In 2021, lawmakers allocated $28.6 billion towards the Restaurant Revitalization Fund for struggling bars and restaurants. According to the Small Business Administration, more than 300,000 restaurants applied. About a third of those applicants received relief funding. This limited relief came after the first round of the Paycheck Protection Program in 2020, which allowed some big chains like Shake Shack and Ruth's Chris Steakhouse to benefit from the funds, even though the program was intended for small businesses. Shake Shack ultimately returned the $10 million it received after criticism. The selection process is unclear, but these rounds of funding left many smaller restaurants, like Mitokaya, without aid money to keep going. To go, right? Yes. Yeah. Just four miles south in downtown Chicago, Gene and Giorgetti was one restaurant that did receive some aid. So the original Gene and Giorgetti is actually right here. But despite its 80-year history in the city, they're still uncertain about their future, urging Congress for more relief. I think it is one of the biggest priorities that they should be looking at right now. In January, the National Restaurant Association called on Congress to replenish the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. Noting a survey of operators found 88% of restaurants saw indoor dining demand wane because of the Omicron variant. And 50% of restaurants who didn't receive the first round of funding of the grant feel it's unlikely they'll stay in business without bailout money. But there's been hesitation from Washington, D.C. The White House telling NBC News in part, we are continuing to closely track the impacts of Omicron and will address if additional targeted relief is needed. But we are not in the same place we were last year. Did I worry about not turning 80 every day? every single day. I still worry every day. You know, I'm third generation. Keeping this restaurant going is, it's a big responsibility. That was NBC's Maura Barrett reporting. Up next, Mexico is struggling to protect journalists from being murdered. Another journalist was just killed there, the fourth one this year. Why are reporters being targeted and what should be done about it? We'll get into that when we come back. So do me a favor, if you're ever talking to a journalist about their work in this political climate, please don't crack some lame joke about killing the messenger. One, we've heard them all. I guarantee yours is just as lame. Two, in some places like Mexico, reporting the truth can actually be deadly work. Consider Lourdes Maldonado. Back in 2019, she begged for help during a press briefing with Mexico's president, Andres Manuel López Obrador. She told him that she feared for her life. Last week, someone shot Ms. Maldonado dead outside her own home in Tijuana. She was a veteran broadcast reporter who covered politics and corruption. On her last radio show, five days before she was killed, she revealed that she had been under state government protection for nearly a year. Lourdes Maldonado is one of at least four journalists killed in Mexico this year. On January 17th, photographer Margarito Martinez was shot dead outside his home in Tijuana. On January 10th, reporter Jose Luis Gamboa was killed in the coastal state of Veracruz. And this Monday, Roberto Toledo was shot and killed. Mexico remains one of the most dangerous countries for journalists. According to the Human Rights Organization Article 19, at least 145 journalists have died in Mexico since the year 2000. Joining us now is Carlos Martinez de la Serna, who's program director at the Committee to Protect Journalists. Welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Why are journalists in Mexico being killed? Well, I first... I, th these these killings are not happening in a vacuum. So, uh, you know, uh, Mexico has high levels of violence and also high levels of impunity. So, killers know they are likely to face any consequence. In this context, uh, it is the deadliest country in the Western Hemisphere for journalists. So, to see these levels of violence, we will need to see to go to conflict zones. So, being a journalist in Mexico. Is heroic, basically. Uh, if, um, every year there are killings, every year there's impunity, every year there's very little progress. 
What's behind the impunity? Does the government just turn a blind eye? Is it overwhelmed? What's going on there? Again, it's the same as the general context with these violence, um, it's part of which these violence is part of it. So um, impunity prevails in the country around crime. So the vast majority of cases, in the vast majority of cases, there's no justice. We only have one case from 1995, a journalist who was murdered, where a full justice was achieved. This means not only the people who actually killed the journalist, but the alleged mastermind. Only one case, as you said, that more than 140 journalists being killed, have been killed in the last 30 years. Even by these standards, what we have seen in the last month, in January, is really dramatic. So we saw four journalists killed in, in a month. We saw two journalists who were attacked in, in very serious attack that escaped or survived. And we and even this data never tells the whole story because the whole story is also about journalists that are missed. We have dozens of journalists that are missing in, in Mexico. We have also uh, journalists who's, who were killed, but it's not clear but the connection with journalists. So we don't know the, right. the reason. Also, there is no progress at all in these investigations. So in most cases, we won't ever know what happened. So you've got journalists who are being killed, some who are disappearing. You have some journalists who apparently were under federal protection programs, like Ms. Maldonado, who we found out had been under a state government protection program for nearly a year. What's the Mexican government doing about this, or perhaps not doing? Is there something that the government should be doing to, to prevent this, or are they kind of doing all they can? No, definitely they should be doing way more. Uh, Lourdes Maldonado, as you said, who was a very um, respected journalist in Tijuana, was under protection. This means that there's a, both federal and state mechanisms uh, designed to protect journalists that are receiving threats and need this type of protection. But the reality is that for state mechanisms, with the exception of the one in uh, Mexico District of Federal, the capital main city at Veracruz, are almost ineffective. Like Lourdes Maldonado, there were police around his around her home um, every day, things like that, but she wasn't under full protection, uh, even she asked for that. Uh, in some cases, mechanisms, the mechanism is late and is under-resourced, under-staffed. So first, the federal government needs to make sure these mechanisms are as effective as they can be uh, in terms of resources, reacting quickly, providing um, all kind of tools and protection they can for journalists under threat. But also they need to work on two critical things. One is on changing the rhetoric about journalism. The, gov the current government of Mexico spends more time criticizing journalists than recognizing the, the severity of this problem. And also it's very important that the justice prevails. So there is no, basically there's a rule of law here. So uh, right. as I, I said before, killers know they won't face any consequence. Carlos Martinez de la Serna, Program Director for the Committee to Protect Journalists. I appreciate you making time. Thank you very much. The Winter Olympic Games just started today. Up first were alpine skiing and an event that a staggering number of you said you love. We'll have an update from Beijing before we go. We have a little bit of breaking news on the Beijing Olympics. China's President Xi Jinping says that he will attend the opening ceremony. This was just reported by CGTN. That's an international news channel that's owned by the Chinese government. Now, the ceremony is on Friday, and again, President Xi says he will attend the opening ceremonies. But the games have already begun. This morning, the U.S. curling team beat Australia 6-5 to in the round-robin mixed doubles tournament. The U.S. plays Norway tomorrow. Meanwhile, a positive COVID test is shaking up Team USA's flag bearers. Bobsledder Elena Myers is in isolation. Speed skater Brittany Bowe and curler John Schuster will take her place. Having a second Olympics in the pandemic is presenting its own unique challenges. The games are happening inside a restricted access perimeter known as a bubble. Reporters, athletes and their teams are all within the competition grounds and there are strict rules to make them stay there.
NBC Steve Patterson joins us now from inside the bubble, reporting from a mountainous region outside of Beijing. Steve, tell us what's going on right now. How's it going? Joshua, good evening over there in the States. Good morning here in China, where if you want to see the bubble, you are essentially looking at it. I want to describe it first of all. It's about 60,000 athletes, coaches, trainers, support staff, workers, and of course, journalists, all essentially in this closed loop system. Rigorous testing and rigorous credentialing to get in, but once you're in, you're essentially not allowed out until the games have ended. It is essentially you know, provided to keep us from the rest of Beijing citizens and the rest of mainland China to try to localize COVID fits right into China's sort of ironclad policy of zero tolerance towards the virus. Uh, that many of the citizens here have agreed with. Although we've already started to see, as you mentioned, some infections, about 200 if you include people coming from the airport, but just in the closed loop itself, 69 people have tested positive, leading many to already say that the bubble has bursted. But Chinese officials say that that will level off as the games continue. And the thing that they really want to focus on is minimizing any sort of community spread, which we have not seen just yet. But it is nerve wracking to be inside here. I have to say that, Joshua. I have to imagine also that the bubble, Steve, is helpful to the Chinese government in terms of just controlling the imagery that comes out of the Olympic Games. I'm sure they want to make another great showing like they did with the Summer Games in 2006, which kind of blew everybody's hair back. But then also in light of concerns about digital surveillance, mistreatment of, of Chinese people of, of Muslim faith in parts of the country, this kind of helps control which way the cameras are pointing and the imagery that comes out. Well, it helps them control everything. I mean, obviously, we know what kind of surveillance state China has turned into. There's a warning from the FBI for all athletes coming to the Olympic Games not to bring your personal phone, your personal laptop, or any information that could be used to hack you. Uh, that's a message that's gone out to the athletes. We know many people are using burner phones while they're here just to control that flow of information. But you're right. I mean, transportation is tightly controlled inside the loop. And again, when there's no access between journalists and the rest of the Beijing public, that messaging is really controlled to just covering the sport. So you're absolutely right uh, about the tight sort of controls that are here, not only in the games, but the rest of mainland China and especially in the Beijing area. Joshua. I asked folks what they wanted to cover. And a bunch of people mentioned an Olympic sport that I guess I didn't realize had such a constituency. And it's the one we mentioned earlier, curling. I didn't know there's so many <laughs> curling fans out there. Here is some of what people said about it. Minus Baby tweeted that it is the Mr. Rogers of Olympic sports, mellow, smooth, and cool. Hema Rain tweeted, it's the only sport that I can watch and reasonably <laughs> think that I might have a chance of doing without rupturing, tearing, or somehow disfiguring myself. What is it about curling, Steve Patterson, that people seem to love so much? It seems at least the team is doing pretty well. They won their match against Australia. The U.S. does really well in curling. And look, I don't want to take anything away from these athletes, which at the highest level of the sport requires extreme focus, extreme determination and patience to be able to do that. Uh, but there is an element of it that it's almost like one of your favorite pub games becomes this highest level sport like darts or cornhole or something like that. And the culture that emerges around that is sort of embraced by the athletes that participate in it. So it, it turns into something that's really fun, not only for the athletes, but for the people watching. And I got to say, man, you got to give it a shot. You know, you, you start watching curling and you see that puck sliding down the ice and then you start getting into it when you start uh, realizing the stakes and knowing what it means. Uh, as you mentioned, they're already starting to play some games. They play so many games that they have have to start before the opening ceremony and throughout really the entirety of the Olympics. And I got to say, it's really fun to watch. Check it out. Right. I, we, we're, we're thinking about it. You might see me. You never know. I could be holding on the puck and just <laughs> across the ice. You never know. It could happen. Thank you, Steve. That is NBC Steve Patterson giving us an update from the first days of the Olympics in Beijing. Now the excitement is building for these games. Got to set myself back down after my curling demonstration. The excitement is building for these games, of course, but so are some of the concerns. Many countries, including the U.S., are staging a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Games. You'll still see the athletes from the U.S. compete, of course, but no U.S. government officials will be visiting Beijing. 
That's in protest of alleged human rights violations against a Muslim ethnic group in China. One Chinese artist is turning to a new form of protest to illustrate his point. Digital keepsakes known as NFTs. NBC foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga has that story. The Beijing Winter Olympics is kicking off this week, regardless of the diplomatic boycott of several countries, including the US. Activists have held protests in the last couple of months in Europe and Asia ahead of the Games, and now Uyghur, Tibetan and Hong Kong activists urge the public not to watch the Games, insisting China is unfit to hold the Games for its alleged records of human rights violation. Ba Dieo Cao, a Chinese political cartoonist, is bringing his protest art, along with the issues, to the NFT world. I want to have a fake advertisement. A collection of five posters will be dropped as NFT art, and each poster depicting a one particular human rights violation from the Chinese government, Uyghur genocide. China has come under fire for detaining and abusing Muslim Uyghurs in the country's Xinjiang province, and what the U.S. says is genocide and crimes against humanity, which includes imprisonment, forced sterilization, rape, torture, and forced labor. The Chinese government called these re-education camps designed to rid them of what they claim are separatist thoughts and religious extremism and denies allegations of human rights abuses. I'm afraid the Chinese government is going to whitewash this entire issue with a celebration of the Olympics. And it will try to silence anyone um, who want to criticize China's human rights record, including the athletes. Because of political censorship Ba Dieo Cao says he has experienced, he now lives in Australia. His posters have touched down in San Francisco and Miami, but have never been to China. I've been making art for 10 years. There's almost no support. There's no grounds. There's no funding. NFT is the latest platform that the digital world has offered to artists. They are unique signatures on digital artworks that prove an ownership. Once a piece is sold, it marks a record on the blockchain that cannot be erased. Websites get in trouble with for political reasons and the government shuts down websites all the time. You can't shut down the blockchain. The servers are all over the world. It's a really cool idea to create an NFT that lives on the blockchain because it can't be erased or shut down by any government. All dissident artists should really try to look into new tech. Um, as a tool for them. Snowden did his papers as an NFT. Pussy Riot just sold an NFT for a lot of money. I do believe that NFT would become a very important force to battering the censorship in China. I hope my very action could bring in more people to joining this meaningful activism. Last December, the United States announced a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Olympics. The Biden administration will not send any diplomatic or official representation to the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics. China called America's boycott a self-directed political farce, claiming it violates the political neutrality of sports. No one cares whether they come or not. Athletes, coaches and even reporters attending the Olympics have to submit a daily COVID monitoring via a web browser or an app. But cybersecurity group Citizen Lab says the app has security problems that could leave a person's sensitive data vulnerable to hacking. A report the International Olympic Committee refutes. They say two cybersecurity companies found no critical vulnerabilities with the app. It's indeed a disappointment that the boycotting was not actually the reality. But what I want to encourage them to do is knowing the essence of this Olympic, knowing the political motivation behind the Chinese government, knowing the human rights violation committed by this government. Well, get themselves informed. That was NBC's Claudio Lavanga reporting. Before we go, thanks to those of you who shared your feedback on this show with us. Last night, we asked you to let us know how we're doing here on Now Tonight. Among other things, you sent us, Zach wrote, Joshua is not biased in his approach, which I think is missing for many shows today. A couple of times he has mentioned being a gay man and how it relates to the story. The more balanced news programs can be in the long run, it will serve all of us better. Thank you, Zach. 
Jennifer writes, keep going. We're refreshed and loving you, but hating the obsessive objects of idiocy, aggressiveness, and entitlement that permeates the news every day. Keep sending out that breath of fresh air. we Will do. And Barbara emailed, I've watched from day one and look forward to it each evening. Joshua does a great job of providing non-partial subjects and alternate views. I really appreciate that. Thank you all for writing in. We also welcome your questions and constructive criticism. What could we be doing more of or less of or just better? Tell us at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. Reach out directly by voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email now tonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.